my channel welcome back to another video i'm messy jesse and you're watching i feel like we're here every single month every single month i'm apologizing for a video being late <sighs> look one day i won't be trash today is not that day Let's move on, shall we? I am finally presenting my very, very late, my belated February slash blackathon wrap up. In the month of February, I read some of my favorite books of all time, as well as some of my potential favorite books of 2021. And this has kind of been a theme in February. It seems like in February, I am constantly every single year selecting a book that just ends up being one of my favorites of the year. I'm just gonna say it, it's because black authors rule. I'm not going to waste much time in this video on lengthy exposition just because I know that I'm going to get really in depth with some of these books so I don't want this video to be too long and I am still catching up on the other videos that I have promised y'all. I said this in my last video and I will continue saying it until I'm all caught up. You will still be seeing my best books and worst books of 2020 for me as well as my channel changes and my stats for 2020. All of that is still coming up. I'm in the process of filming all of those videos as well as some new videos for y'all. I have at least three and I might bundle these up into one, but I have at least three books that wasted my time videos that are planned for the month of April that you will absolutely see no matter what. Spank me if I don't produce those videos. <laughs> Let's be honest, it'll be the most action that I've seen in a in a long time. So we're due. Hopping into my reading statistics for the month of February. In the month of February, I read a total of 12 books with my page count totaling 4,058. The average length of the books that I read was 338 pages with my average star rating coming in at 4.6. Now for my genres read, I read two mystery books, three science fiction books, four fantasy books, and three of the books were literary fiction. Four of the books that I read came from my local library, while three of those books were audiobooks, and five of them came from my personal physical library. Let's first talk about a couple books that I was not able to get to, although they were on my TBR. One of the TBR cards that I pulled for the month of February was the adaptation card, which said that I had to read a book that had been adapted into a movie. I don't know why I said adapted like that. We've got questions and I have no answers. For that, I chose the Get Out screenplay. Yes, I know that the movie came out before the screenplay, but I decided to stretch this prompt and I unfortunately did not get to this, even though it is very easily consumable. It just didn't happen. So I am going to read this for another one of my TBR cards reading vlog. So you'll still get to see my thoughts on this. Get Out, of course, is one of my favorite movies. We all know that Jordan Peele is a master mind of horror and of social commentary. So I'm really excited to get to this. Another one of my TBR cards had a prompt that said a book that people either love or hate. And for that prompt, I decided to select Year of the Witching, which is a, <laughs> get it, witch, witches, witches. What up my witches? <laughs> Oh my god, I can physically feel y'all unsubscribing. <laughs> you would think I would stop making these shitty jokes so that my channel could grow, but I just can't help myself. Ooh, you come here for a messy time, not a quality time. Let's talk about the positives of this book. This book was recently featured in a Black Girl Magic slash TBR card reading vlog, which I will leave linked down below if you are interested in my journey. Let us just say that I can very clearly, crystal clearly, see why this is a hate or love book. When I started reading this book, you know what? I'm not giving a synopsis. This video is going great. 
We are following a biracial black and white woman who is living in a puritanical society. Her name is Emmanuel, and her mother passed away when she was very young. Because of the fact that she is biracial, her very existence, again, why did I say that word that way? I speak English. Her very existence is blasphemy. And so because of this, she compensates for her existence by being devoted to her society's puritanical beliefs and conforming whenever possible. But Emmanuel has questions, she has doubts and concerns, and inside of herself is this desire to push back against the rigid customs and abuses that take place in the society. When she stumbles into the forest, she encounters witches and an incredible dark magic that leaves her changed forever. These witches bestow upon Emmanuel her mother's secret diary, which talks at length about her mother's consorting with witches, leading Emmanuel well deeper and darker into the forest and its seductive powers. My favorite thing about this novel was that it mastered atmosphere. I truly felt that I was in the woods with Emmanuel. I was seduced by the witches just as she was. The writing, the descriptions of the dark wood were alluring and irresistible. I also loved that the whole atmosphere of the novel was so well crafted. Not just the scenes where Emmanuel is exploring the woods, but the scenes where Emmanuel is exploring herself. The scenes of confrontation between Emmanuel and women in the village who see themselves as above her. All of that was so well executed. I was very much transported into the story truly from page one. And then you throw in the fact that the writing is simply stunning. The quotes in this novel are so deeply beautiful, absolutely breathtaking. And the descriptions of the scenery, the greenery, the woods, the sounds of nature, all of that draws you into the story as if you were truly watching a movie. I have seen the evils of this world and I have loved them. I first saw you by the riverside. There was sun on your cheeks and wind in your curls, and you sat with your feet in the water, smiling at me. I don't think I'd felt real fear until that moment, but father as my witness, I feared you. It is very easy to see why the writing was so consumable, why the story felt as if it were my own. And on top of that, I really loved the character work in this novel, not just the character work for our protagonist, which was spectacular. She was naive, but brave. She was selfish and selfless. She was a girl that contained multitudes, and I really loved that about her. She had so much fire, but she also knew when to be reserved and when to calculate. And she's just one of my favorite types of protagonists. I really connected with Emmanuel, with her sense of being othered within her own village, within her community, with her wanting to belong deeply to her community, but recognizing that it had to change, that it was unsustainable and cruel in so many ways. I also really enjoyed Martha, Emmanuel's grandmother. Martha is a very complex, morally gray, dark character. A character that is really difficult to root for, but I found that her character was handled with so much empathy and complexity that I found myself understanding her actions, even if I didn't condone them, and even if I would have acted differently myself. And that is what I always ask for in a novel. Even if you give me a villain, even if you give me a character who operates in a way that is entirely woefully different, that flies against the face of my own set of values and moral code. If you can give me that kind of character and still make me empathize with them and understand them, that's when I know that character work has been truly, truly executed. So yes, I loved the storytelling. I loved Ezra. I loved Ezra's backstory and his conflict with his father, the prophet. I just thought that the characters were so immaculately done. So I have to give big props to the storytelling, the character work, and the beautiful writing. However, this book went from a five star to a three star read at the drop of a hat. And I'm not going to talk about my issues with this book here because I am making a Books That Wasted My Time video where I will explore my issues with this text at length. The reason why I still gave it three stars despite the ending that made me want to burn my eyes from my socket is because of all of the good that happened in this book. So 
three stars. I also pulled the Tochi Onyabuchi card from my TBR cards and the prompt for that card is to read a work of Afrofuturism and for that prompt I selected Rebel Sisters which is by Tochi Onyabuchi himself and is the sequel to War Girls. This is a series that follows two sisters I believe in the year 2172 in war-torn Nigeria and features loads of commentary on the widely understudied Biafran War. In this novel, we are following Ifi, who is now living in space. She has made it as a medical doctor, and she is working in this space colony and trying to figure out what is plaguing the ranks of children who have fallen ill to this mysterious virus and are in comas. This journey leads her to return to Earth in order to seek out the answers to her questions as well as to confront her own dark past. In addition, we are also following a mysterious robot who is pulled from a scrap of heap. A scrap of heap? A heap of scraps. And is slowly putting themselves together and figuring out where they came from, what their purpose is, and who they want to be moving forward. Oh, there is so much that I can say about this book. I read this book in the Black Girl Magic TBR card reading vlog that I also read Year of the Witching. So again, that will be linked down below if you would like my full thoughts. Again, Tochi just did such a bang up job. I enjoyed War Girls. I think I gave it four stars, but this, this is one of those books that makes reading the first book worth it. And I say that tentatively because it, it sounds like I'm saying that War Girls wasn't a great book, but this is so much better. It takes, I think that War Girls is really all set up just like the, um, the fifth season, the first book in the Broken Earth trilogy, all set up. And in my opinion, the following two books are just top tier and they couldn't be that if we hadn't gotten that first spectacular introduction to the world. This is a book that touches on so many amazing incredible topics such as colonization and having complex relationships with people that have traditionally held power over you. Ifi is very close with two white women who helped her become the doctor that she is but these white women are very problematic and have a whole lot to learn but Ifi loves them regardless regardless, while she also has mixed feelings about them because they say and do some really ignorant shit. The technology really shines in this book and I love just Efi's manipulation of technology. Again, fantastic representation of black girls in STEM, fantastic representation of girlhoods, of black girl magic and black beauty. I loved that the Asian characters take a bigger role in this story and that the unraveling of the mystery was so intricate and beautifully executed. The mystery was one of my favorite elements of this book. It was a fantastic way of keeping the reader consistently engaged and it was very impressively intricate. But again, the commentary on PTSD and individuals being forced to commit war crimes or choosing to commit war crimes under their circumstances was phenomenal. Ifi definitely has done some sketchy things in the war and this book is her having to reconcile and face the things that she has done and come to terms with the impact of her choices. Again, I really, really love that. She's a fantastic, morally ambiguous character, but also so brave and resilient and flawed and nuanced. And I really, really adored every part of her and getting to see her character really shine in this book. This is also a book about love and finding your way back to your loved ones and about the perseverance of love itself. I loved that one of the heavy components of this book was about how the government has made the act of remembering the war completely completely illegal and gone in and systematically erased everybody's memory of the war itself. And I love that the book demonstrated what happens when you displace memories from a people, when you force people not to talk about something that deeply traumatized them, the way that that trauma still lives in your body, the way that it still affects you, even if you don't have cognitive access to it, it just was such great commentary, very subtle but powerful commentary on censorship and dispossession. I I just really love this book and I truly can't wait to read it again someday. 
five out of five stars. And I pulled the what if card, which said to read a strange, odd, or innovative premise. And for that, I chose The Prophets, which is a literature novel about two gay men who fall in love on a plantation in the deep south. I did not end up finishing The Prophets in February, but you definitely will see that in my March wrap up. And the final TBR card that I pulled in the month of February was the Black Lives Matter card. And that is a book that centers Black Lives Matter. And for that prompt, I decided to select how Beautiful We Were. How Beautiful We Were is a devastating novel that is set in the fictional African village of Kosawa, told through the voices of the village's children and spanning across generations. This novel speaks truth about the various ways that American oil companies exploit African peoples, poisoning their land and leading to innumerable deaths. After decades of this American oil company drilling on their land and making living absolutely unsustainable. The water is poisoned. The land itself is poisoned to the point where the land will not be able to yield crops for hundreds of years. The people are starving. The children are dying. Finally, after decades of this, the children and the adults of the village decide to fight back. I selected this book for the Black Lives Matter prompt because this is a Black Lives Matter issue. Issues of environmental justice as they impact black lives also count as Black Lives Matter issues. When white owned companies and corporations make conditions absolutely unlivable in black neighborhoods, that is a Black Lives Matter issue. When pollution causes black lives to die, that is a Black Lives Matter issue. And that is a component of racial injustice that is not often spoken about. It is not often spoken about the high rates of asthma that black children live with, specifically because they are forced to live in areas that are highly polluted. It does not speak of the birth defects and many other health issues as well as the psychological impact caused by these issues that are forced upon Black communities, both Black and African alike, because of the ghettoization of our neighborhoods and countries. I cannot speak about this novel for too long without tears springing to my eyes. The writing was so effective. I felt every single one of these deaths. I felt every single one of these families being torn apart. And one of the most amazing things about this novel was how deeply and how well it built up the idea of this village and of life and the culture and the customs and the celebrations and the issues, all of that, and how all of that was impacted and destroyed by the drilling over decades. You truly get to see from page one all the way to the end, the, the cultural genocide, as well as the literal genocide that these people endure. And the loss of these customs of language, of land, was truly made to feel as equally significant as the literal deaths. And all of those things are seen as so much less important in the face of actual death, which is deeply dismissive of the psychological and emotional trauma that, that wreaks upon Black souls. I cannot wait to reread this book and this is the book that I am fairly certain will be my favorite read of 2021. I cannot beg individuals to read this book enough, especially if you are just getting into learning about environmental justice, but I don't want to make this book seem as if it is only about environmental justice and about colonization. It isn't. This book is a galaxy in a novel. It is a universal story of love and of femininity and of masculinity. It is a story about culture and language and immigration and resistance and just everything in a novel. The writing is beautiful. And I have a audiobook that I'm so excited to dig into. I wouldn't be surprised if I read this book again multiple times before the end of the year. I'm not seeing any hype for this book on booktube and very little hype for it on bookstagram. So please, 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 please pre-order this book, read it. It it truly is my heart and soul, but make sure you have tissues on hand, lots of them. Now we are going to hop in to my Blackathon wrap up. I was on Team Thriller. I was the host for Team Thriller slash horror and I had an absolute blast. It was so much fun. So I'm going to talk about the four prompts for Team Thriller. The books that I read for those prompts, I am so freaking excited. I just, I had such a great reading month, y'all. <clears throat> Aside of 
year of the witching but we're not going to talk about that for the megan giddings prompt read a book about a new town with an old secret i selected the changeling by my favorite author victor laval well he's one of my top three favorite authors he is freaking brilliant a great supernatural and horror author unfortunately i did not end up getting to this book because it was supposed to be sent to me by the publisher and it must have gotten lost in the mail because I was waiting for it and then I just forgot about it. So I never read it. I'm going to order myself a copy. I know I'm going to love it. I love everything that Victor Laval has written. The next prompt was actually named after Victor Laval and that was Supernatural or Paranormal Horror. And for that, I selected Slay, a vampire anthology, Black Vampires. I am not done with this book okay because this it's a chunky monkey but that's not the reason why i'm not done with it it's because this is just such a comfort read and such a fun read that i didn't want to rush it one of the things that i love about this anthology is that it is separated by location so the first set of stories take place in america and in the united kingdom the next set of stories part two of the book is set in various locations in africa and then the final part of the book is set in the future so right now i I am in part two. I am in the African stories and I just, I'm really enjoy. It's just so much fun. For that reason, I didn't want to rush it. I am allowing myself time to be slow and gentle and just to enjoy these stories. Now I'm definitely going to say there, are, there have been multiple stories that I thought were underwritten and most definitely were not for me. But for every one of those stories, there are three that I just, I just had an absolute blast with and really loved. And even the stories that weren't for me, I thought were still really creative. And I love how many of the stories take the myth of the vampire and just turn it on its head and do such really creative and interesting things with the idea of the vampire. Not all of the vampires are bloodsuckers. There are a lot of mythical monsters in this book. There is so much Afrofuturism. There is so much queerness. There is transness. Some stories are kind of sensual and paranormal and romantic, while others are just straight up horrifying. Some of them are comedic in tone. Some of them are deeply solemn. And for that reason, that's why I'm going so slowly with this book. So I could have finished it in February, but I decided to just take my time with it. So I am going to continue doing that. Then for the Rachel Housel prompt, read a book with a decadent setting, I decided to select the Strivers's Row Spy. This is the first in a duology. In this book, we are following recent college graduate named Sydney Temple, who immediately after college graduation is approached by someone from the Bureau of Investigation, commonly now known as the FBI, and asked to spy on prominent black leader W.E.B. Du Bois, as well as Marcus Garvey. Sydney, being a man who champions black liberation acquiesces to spy on these men for the FBI what he is doing in actuality is spying for W.E.B. Du Bois now he doesn't care much for Marcus Garvey and has deep issues with Garvey's politics but what he does is make sure that he is protecting Du Bois and sends him kind of covert letters warning him when the FBI is getting close to sabotaging him he is forced to keep his antics with the Bureau of Investigation secret from his wife and as tensions rise high in the novel he begins to realize exactly what and whose lives are at stake. Now, I love this novel was set in the 1920s in New York City. It is a truly vibrant, decadent setting. I can think of fewer decadent settings than New York City in the 1920s. And that was carried over so well by the writing. The atmosphere of the novel was nothing short of transportive. The author beautifully revives many prominent figures from this time period, including poet Claude McKay, so many black musicians, make appearances in the novel. Robert Williams, you have prominent artists and politicians, as well as incredible landmarks and locations. I love that this book was centered around the idea and the location of Strivers's Row. For those who are not familiar, Strivers's Row was an aristocratic neighborhood located in West Harlem. It was home to the Black Dicties of the time, and they were called Strivers because they strived to move up in the social life. Matter. I thought this novel was such an entertaining way to consume what is nothing short of a glowing history. I studied the Harlem Renaissance in college and I just, I loved it. 
Those of you who have been following me for a while know that I'm actually really big into vintage music, fashion, and I'm a huge fan of the 20s. I got to live the 20s through this book. That alone was reason enough for me to give the book five out of five stars. But this book is so much more than a charming atmosphere. Yes, it brings to life the glowing black history of this era, but it also does so much more. It speaks at length of the black resistance and self-education of this period. For example, the FBI approaches our protagonist because they don't even realize that Sydney actually is a radical resistance fighter. But during this time period, to be associated with any kind, any kind, no matter how peaceful, any kind of black liberation meant that you were literally blacklisted and prevented from getting any kind of professional job. And Sydney knows that if he is caught reading these black liberation newspapers, that he'll never be able to secure a job as an engineer or a professor. So essentially, they have these burn after reading laws where not laws, but where these black newspapers are secretly published, they get into the hands of black folks who want to read them, and then they have to burn them afterward to make sure that the police and employers don't realize that this information is being circulated. And so I loved how this book talked about the very subtle ways that black resistance has always taken place. There is this wide misconception that black resistance just started in the 50s like black people were like enough is enough and now we're gonna protest but that was happening even on on plantation fields black people have always resisted black people have always had dialogue about how to fight back and to end oppression and i just loved the, the way that, that was represented in the novel i also really appreciated that our protagonist decides to buy also not just because he really looks up to du bois and wants to help him but because by helping du bois he feels that he is ensuring a better America for his children. I love that Sydney just simply refuses to accept things the way that they are. And as he says in the text, to accept it will kill a part of me. And I just, I really, really appreciated him as a protagonist. I'm so excited to see where the story goes in the next book. It was so elaborate and there was a lot of really good, great action scenes, especially at the end. I think that this is Definitely more of a slow paced mystery though. So if you were going into this expecting guns blazing, you're not gonna get that. This is a slow, meticulous, political story set in the 1920s. So be mindful of that going in. And I gave it five out of five stars. And the final book that I read for Blackathon Team Thriller was Wife of the Gods. This was the group book for Team Thriller and it was absolutely phenomenal. This is a Ghanaian mystery where we are following a detective named Dawson who gets sent on this mission to find out what happened to a promising female medical student who goes missing. And this kind of brings him into a village where an old custom is still in practice. And that is this custom of taking a child who comes from a family that has committed some sort of sin. And this child is married off to a priest and has to produce an heir for him in order to cleanse her family of their previous sins. Detective Dawson absolutely does not agree with this practice. And a big part of this novel is different characters presenting their perspective perspectives, their cultural perspectives, their moral and personal beliefs on this practice. And I really appreciated how deeply that this practice was explored at length. Our detective is having to confront his own issues and prejudices against villagers and kind of condemning their suspicions. So I liked that there was cultural clashing in this book as well. One of the things that I really appreciated about this book was that it just wasn't a empty headed mystery. While the mystery was great and there was a reveal at the end that I wholly did not see coming, there were a few plot twists that really caught me off guard in the best way. But I loved that we had a beautiful balance of cultural commentary, social commentary, and criticism throughout this novel. And I thought that, that all of those things were really well done. It also is a novel about old griefs and family. And I loved the relationship between Dawson and his wife. I found it complex, but supportive and beautiful. I really enjoyed this book. I gave it a four out of five stars. Oh, I'm sorry, a 4.5 out of five stars. And I loved it so much that I went and got myself a copy of it. And then I also got myself a copy of the sequel in the series. I think that there's three or four in the series and I am very, very excited to continue. All right, now those were the books that I read for Blackathon and I have four more books that I need to talk about, but 
This video already is 47 minutes long and it's late at night. To be honest, I'm tired of filming and I try to be honest with y'all. I try not to fake enthusiasm on my channel ever. You get me as I am in that moment. Authenticity is really important to me. So I'm just gonna be honest, like these last four books, we're just gonna blow through, which is fine because I actually don't have all that much to say about them with the exception of this one. So we're gonna save that one for the very end. The first book that I'm gonna talk about is The Lesson. This was a the group book for teen science fiction fantasy. It is set in the Virgin Islands where these aliens called the Ina come and colonize. They bring amazing technology with them and are kind of just there to observe and study. However, they respond to any act of aggression against them with a disproportionate amount of aggression in response. So basically, do not funk with these creatures because they will literally rip you limb from limb. And so this is a story about the society, the individuals of the Virgin Islands trying to live with these aliens. I really enjoyed this novel. I have very few criticisms for it. And to be honest, I'm still kind of ruminating and sitting on it. I would love to reread this via audio form because I still haven't entirely formulated my thoughts on this. So for now, it's sitting somewhere between a 4.25 and a four out of five stars and that's okay. It's cool to normalize just needing time to make up your mind about a book. I enjoyed it. I really want to reread it in audiobook form. I think that would help me get even more out of the story. A lot of people had issues with the ending. A lot of people had issues with the fact that the kind of alien technology and the aliens themselves aren't very deeply explored. A lot of people felt that the sci-fi elements weren't as science fiction-y as they were wanting. But again, it's a science fiction that's not through a white lens and it's important to acknowledge and recognize that authors of color might approach science fiction differently from how white authors do. That's all I'm gonna say. Then I read Legendborn. I finally read it. So long and I'm, I'm so proud. This is a powerful debut centering Arthurian magic and legends and we have a black girl at a academic institution for higher learning and it's just, it's everything that people said that it was and more. Then I read Transcendent Kingdom. This is my first Yaja C novel. I still, I have Home Going on my shelf. And I'm so excited to read it, especially after this. This is a novel about a black girl named Gifty who is still reeling after her brother's death. Her brother died of a heroin overdose and she never truly recovered from his death. Currently, she is a sixth year PhD candidate studying neuroscience and she works specifically trying to unravel the mysteries of addiction. Meanwhile, her mother has been bedridden with depression ever since the loss of her son. However, they are a deeply Christian family and her mother absolutely refuses any kind of psychiatric help either in the form of counseling or medical intervention. And the only type of care that she will accept is her pastor coming over and praying for her. So this is a novel that talks about faith and Christianity at length and how that impacts these characters who are of Ghanaian ancestry. They are a Ghanaian family. Now I loved this book. I loved the representation of black girls in STEM and what that looks like. I loved the depiction of addiction and how addiction destroys families, but also how addiction affects the lives of those around the afflicted. I loved the conversation about blackness and religion and certain black attitudes regarding therapy and medical intervention. All of that was extremely well done. Now I've heard a lot of people say that they rated this book down because they didn't like how much that it centered around Christianity. The family is Christian. So that's a big part of their life. And even though I am not Christian, I am not religious in any way, shape or form, I'm not really interested in reading about religion. I accept that religion is a part of other people's lives and so it wouldn't make me rate a book down just because the main character is of a religion that I'm not and that religion of course is important to them so of course it appears in the text. I gave this 4.5, 4.25 stars, not because of any overt issues that I have with the novel. I felt that something was missing and I still can't put my finger on what it was. It, it was still an incredible incredible novel and it is one that I would recommend. I want to have more energy to talk about this last book because this book and how beautiful we were were neck and neck for my favorite books of February and again 
this book will also very likely appear on my top books of 2021 list. I think I'm going to actually do a dedicated Black Girl Magic book review for this book, which is She Would Be King by Wyettu Moore. And the reason why I want to do a dedicated book review for this is because I feel like this is a woefully misunderstood book. And I've read so many reviews and none of the reviews captured the way that I felt about this book. None of the reviews that I've read touched on all of the things that I saw and felt in this book, especially to the depth that they appear in this text. This is a novel about three black characters. Each of these characters are super powered and they live in different locations. One lives in Jamaica, one is on a plantation in Virginia, and the other is in the West African village of Lai. And in this story, which is narrated by the wind, who is its own character in the novel, these three characters come together ultimately in Monrovia, Liberia, and it is the story of Liberia's formation. This book features so much. We get to talk about Jamaica during the era of maroons and colonizers, Virginia during the slave trade, and all of the awful politics that were at play in Liberia's formation, specifically ex-black slaves going over to Liberia and taking over the land and endangering, killing, and oppressing the indigenous. It was one of the most imaginative, well-researched novels that I've ever read in my life. I love how highly it spoke about black and African indigeneity. Again, it's, it's late. I'm tired, I've been filming for an hour, and I just don't have the energy to talk about this book in the way that I want to. I will say that I read the audiobook, and it took me damn near all month to read this book because I kept rewinding the audiobook. I kept being lulled by the narrator's voice, and there were just lines that just made me want to weep. And there was this Goodreads review, the only Goodreads review that came close to depicting how I felt about this novel. And there's a quote that I wanna to read to you from that review. If the spirits lifted me from my body tonight and this was the last book I ever read, I would dance with laughter and joy. I'm going to just put that down because I'm not gonna do the book justice. If you are interested in my thoughts on that book, definitely just keep your eyes out for a dedicated review. Myself and Ashley did not get submissions for the writing contest, but Lauren did. And I read the winning story in our Blackathon live show, which I will leave linked down below if you wanna check that out. That was so much fun. It was like 45 minutes. You definitely have to watch it. It was really, really good. And that story was beautiful. It was an incredible, fantastical story. And I will leave that story linked down below in a Google Doc so that you can, y'all can check it out and enjoy it. Major congratulations to the beautiful author and I have forwarded the prize money over to them. Thank you so much everybody who participated in Blackathon, whether you were making videos or just reading at home, whatever. This was our third running year and it was truly spectacular and beautiful. It was everything that I wanted and more and y'all made it so so special. If you made it to the end of this wicked long video, please let me know in the comment section down below by telling me what your favorite decade in history is. You can say the 20s, you can say 30s. It doesn't have to be a long comment. You can just put two zero or three zero. If you want to elaborate, cool, go for it. I would love to hear your elaborations. For me, it's gonna be the 1920s. There's other decades that come really close, but it's always, 1920s always takes that cake for me, honey. If you want more content from me, you can follow me on my Instagram, which is bowties and books, but all of my social media links will be in the description box below. Until next time, wear your mask, and I can't wait to see you in my next video.